well, we got this awesome Infinity, and I'd really like to take it out for its paces, but I can't. Why is that? Well, the seat's jammed all the way up here. It moves a little bit, goes back, tilts to the right, tilts to the left, barely moves at all. I'm stuck in this position. Today on Tech Garage, we're going to diagnose and fix this so we can take it out for its paces. Man, I can't believe Brian's making me drive this thing to the shop. I should have got a rollback. I'll meet you over at the shop. Welcome to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, I got the Infinity in the shop, and I pride myself out of the driver's seat. Brian, I'm glad you didn't have to witness that, because it would have took the whole show. It looked like a sloth climbing out of a tree, man. We need some help with that seat. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it's not as exciting as, of a job as bolting on a bunch of horsepower or performance, but you've got to have the seat in the right location. Doesn't matter what you're driving. If you want to be safe and drive well in all conditions, you got to have your feet and your hands and your body in the right position. And clearly, we've got a problem here. You know what? And I brought my voltmeter over. I was ready to go, but I got to thinking on the way over. It moves some. It's shifting. And you know, we always use strategy-based diagnosis here on Tech Garage, and it's a good method. I mean, think about it. If the passenger seat's working and the driver's seat's not working, it's probably not a fuse because they're fused up together. You'd have to look in the schematic and find out. But ours, it's moving, Brian. I mean. I I just don't know what's wrong with it, well, but let's you can just, give it a try. Let's verify what you experienced. So it looks like the lumbar is going backwards and forward just fine. That looks to be okay, right? But if we try to slide it like you did, I mean, there's a crazy twist going on here. No way that's going to work. A crazy twist so, is a great word. Yeah. I mean, the crazy twist kind of gives us that strategy-based diagnosis to where it's moving. I mean, it's moving back and forth. We probably have a mechanical issue, a motor gearing issue, but yeah. probably not an electrical issue. Now, Brian, I think it's best we just pull the seat out. Number one, we can see what's going on. Number two, our viewers can see it as well. While you're doing that, though, I'm going to set up a really cool demo so we can see all the motors, amp draw, just in case something gets stuck in the seat. Everybody will understand what's going on. Yeah. Perfect. Let me get this guy out of here. So with just about any seat configuration, there's usually four mounting bolts. I'm going to get these front ones broken loose and out. Now, when you're dealing, in, especially in a nice car like this one, you know, you don't want to do any damage to the interior when we pull this big beastie seat out. That steel frame rail could scratch things up. So get yourself a cover, get the steering column up and out of the way. Give yourself every chance you can to have space. Let me get these fronts out. So once we get the front ones out, I'll move to the back. Now, this is one of those jobs that's not super exciting, but there's a real high potential ROI here. This seat, new, the whole sub framework and the new motors and everything starts at $800. So this is worth our time and effort to see if we can repair it. And if it's a mechanical issue, it's gonna be far less than that to actually repair. So I'm gonna move to the back. Those are gonna be tough. One flat at a time, old school with a box end wrench. I'll get this tipped up, get everything labeled. But John's gonna show you how this whole complex system really works. Brian's right, it is a complex system, but I think we can simplify it for you. Here it is on the schematic here, and we'll just find the reclining motor. It goes down with a pink wire and comes up the green. It's a bi-directional motor. Put power down one side, ground the other, it goes in one direction, switch it, it goes in the other. And I can show it to you right here on this actual simple motor. Here's a motor right here. I got positive and negative, watch this. So if I hit this to the positive and I hit it to the negative, it's going in that direction, it's going around. You saw it spin. Now if I reverse the leads, what's gonna happen? it's going in the other direction. That's how the seat motor works, when you go forward or you go back, and you can see it in action right here. If I'm going back, I'm going forward, it's just changing that direction in the motor. Now this one can tilt up, it can tilt down, so which is really cool. But when you're dealing with a lot of kids like I am, two kids and a wife, you might get some stuff. You're just wondering why the brush and M&Ms and the headphones are sitting there? Well, I'll show you why, because stuff's gonna get caught up in the tracks, it's just normal. If it gets caught up in the tracks, you start to get an amp draw. And what an amp draw is, it's too much current. Current causes heat, and that's what blows your fuse or your circuit breaker, and then you wonder why you have a problem. So watch this, is pretty cool. So if I run this thing back and forth, you can see we're dealing with you know about three to five amps as it goes in both directions. That's normal amp draw, but if I wedge this brush in there and I start running it back, it gets caught up in there. Look at the amps. Oh man, 12, 14, 15, eventually I'm 
going to burn this wire harness, I'm going to blow a fuse, or I'm going to blow a circuit breaker, one or the other. But you want to keep those tracks clean. Now, if you suspect it's a motor, I actually have a motor hooked up right here to a DVOM, and I switched it over to volts. This is pretty easy. You can do this as well. Motor's not working, but I have to make sure I have power there. So I said it was a bi-directional motor. Check this out. If I go up, it's 12 volts. If I go down, 12 volts. The key is, though, check out up. Negative 12 volts, down, positive 12 volts. Negative 12 volts, positive 12 volts. What that tells me is I have power to the motor, my motor must be bad. If I didn't, I just wanna go up, strategy-based diagnosis to the switch and check it out and see what's going on. We suspect ours is a mechanical problem, but we're gonna find out in a minute because Brian's about ready to pull the seat out. Okay, everything's loose. I just got done labeling all the connectors and their mounts. Now I'm gonna tip this seat back and use one of our more high-tech tools, the cell phone. And I'm gonna take a picture here of this wiring scheme just so I have some type of reference document. I've got the schematic online. This is just kind of quicker and easier to do. Now, with this up, you can see that with the Sharpie, I actually labeled one, two, three, four. These are both kind of animal plug connectors. They come out one at a time, but I just like to have that reference. So let me get this master disconnected, these all disconnected. Now, I'll work these out. You can see, come out here first. I put a one here on the end, only goes one way, lines up with one, three, and three. So we're good. So this is a point where you probably need a buddy. In our case, Chief Tech Chase is gonna join me here and help get this beastie seat up out. Again, we don't wanna damage anything, so we're gonna be slow and methodical and get this over to the bench for a proper diagnosis. Thank you, Chase. Big old seat here now. It sure Ryan, is. When you fix this now, don't put it in your house. Yeah, put it <laughs> you back got in that the right. Car. You got that right, it okay. Oh, I like, come on. Okay, right yep, I got this side. I'll come around there to you. Okay, yep, appreciate it. Support that top. I got it. All right, off to the bench. Hey, stay with us on Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is being brought to you by Steel Rubber Products, quality crafted rubber parts and weather stripping. Evapo Rust, super safe rust remover. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Well, I'm sure glad that Chase and Brian actually brought the seat over here. Welcome back to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Brian, this thing is a beast. It is heavy duty underneath, but I like that. There's a lot of safety, a lot of engineering built into this seat. So I'll tell you what we did discover, the drive motor, there's not two going fore and aft, there's just one, and there's a drive shaft going over to the passenger side. So given the way that seat was twisting on you, I think over here's where we're gonna start. That tells me. Well, let's go ahead and pull this off. Let's do a little exploratory surgery in there and see what's going on. Sure. You get that bolt off right there. The motor goes across is what Brian was saying. So it's driving both sides with one motor. So really what was going on with me there is I was moving to the left or right, but this side wasn't moving. So I'm figuring we got something either going on with the track. Uh, we'll be all right without that. I think these okay. go all the way down okay. in there. So Good we'll deal. pick up the plate. So this is really important. If you're doing this, the tracks have to be phased, which means you don't want to have one track way further forward or backward than the other track. Because if this is a gear issue and we replace it, then you're out of phase and you're not, not going to get the travel you want and you could damage that gear if that's what you replaced. What do you right, got here, buddy? So I got the top pieces there. There's some washers right here. Let me see if I can pick them out. I don't, I don't look like that. I see some splines, but I don't see anything going on in there so far. No worries, Throw them I around. Got them. Yep. All right, good. Because, yeah, we're going to need all this. Uh oh, here comes the. Oh, boy. You see it? Yep. There Take you go. Take a look inside of there. Wow. Yeah, you can see that? Wow. Actually, I can probably just go in there and. Now They're this all, is common, again, oh, you know, nice. these are Look usually, yep, plastic gears. Oh, I'll get you another one. I'm flinging them around as bad as they're broken. And this gear would have broken. It probably got loaded up. Something got jammed under the track. Somebody tried to force the seat. Passenger side was working. John's right leg would Look go forward. Here they come. Left side wouldn't move. One more, Brian. I think I can get them all out of there. Look at that. Look at that. Yep. There's Man. your surgery. Yep. Wow. So there's the teeth now. Let's go to the Rock Auto toolbox here, and we've got extra seed parts. <laughs> nice. and I think we've got the right worm gear. And here's the key right here. I mean, the whole apparatus, this thing, Brian was talking about eight, nine hundred, could be twelve hundred, just depending on the car, if you have to buy this whole seed apparatus. But you know what? Four dollars and fifty cents. Got a new gear there. Look at that. And it's Pop just it a down. worm drive, yep. so it can go in at any index. It's okay. Yep. It, there goes, it goes in one way. Look at that. So now we're catching the seat. There it goes down and in there. You can feel it. It's tight. Nice, beautiful. Right? 
So it's a matter of just putting the plate back on. We'll put the washer back on here and secure it. And I'm pretty confident, of course, we'll give it a test ride, but I'm pretty confident that's gonna solve the problem with that thing chipped for $4.50, we're good to go. That's at least a $796 ROI, so good work. Man. Beautiful, get the plate on, we'll get it torqued down. All that's left, we need to go put it back in the car. There we go. Well, that's the final of all four mounting bolts. We got the framework back, one with the vehicle, so we can test drive the seat motors. If there was any play there, we could damage those seat motors or actuators. So I'm gonna get in and test drive this thing. All right, so if you remember for John, it was moving right but not left, and there was a twist to it. So I'm gonna go first thing, fore and aft. No sounds, feels very fluid, it's parallel. Both tracks are working right. We fixed that motor, that's good news. Now, to make sure I got all the electronic connectors appropriately reconnected, I'm gonna test everything else. Here's back, forward, back, smooth. Here's the hip hugger, that's great. Lower lumbar, that's great. This thing is in great shape. I'll tell you what, we, we spent a little bit of time on this project, but we saved a ton of money ended up being a $4.50 part from rockauto.com. So our time was absolutely worth it. I'm anxious to get this thing back on the road. John's gonna be happy because now he can drive it however he wants to. So stay with us on Tech Garage, brought to you by rockauto.com. Welcome back to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Now we got the project M&M &M, back into the shop. We're addressing another code. On our prior episode, we looked at that P0300, which was a misfire. Man, we got all new coils on here. Tom's back with us with rockauto.com. The coils and spark plugs, we're in good shape, man. It idled smooth, but you took it on the test drive. How'd it drive? It, it drove real, or ran real smooth too, like a V8 should. Lots of power and, and no hesitation. That's awesome, and now we need to address that second code we had, and that was a PO442. That was a small evaporative emission leak. Well, what does that mean? Well, evaporative emissions is an emission system that actually catches the fumes, and we're gonna check it with this smoke machine right here. And you can see when I push the button, it's actually gonna develop some smoke, and when it develops some smoke, it's gonna go through the system. There it is right there. So Tom, if you walk them through, how are we gonna introduce this into the system? Well, there's a, a port right here that has a Schrader valve in it, similar to what you'd have to put air in your tire. I'll just pop that out and then I can introduce the smoke. And when you do that, it's gonna run through the whole system. And once he starts introducing the smoke into the system, I got a flashlight right here, Tom. I'll start looking for it, go ahead. We look around the purge solenoid and up top here, running back to the car, I don't see much here. You keep introducing the smoke. I'll take a peek back here. Now, gas caps, very common. Nothing there. Smoking under the car, Tom. You know what that means. <laughs> yeah, we have a whole system that's underneath the car, and the whole system's located right here. This is actually the charcoal canister, and the charcoal canister is what stores those evaporative emissions. I'll show you that in a second. But Tom, this whole system, it's pretty cool because we can get the separate components at Rock Auto, or we can get the whole thing. Here's an actual purge solenoid, which is located up here. What does that do? Well, you've got fuel, va fuel vapors coming up from the tank. They're gonna be sucked through the manifold and burned up in the engine. And then when the car is off, vapors might come back out. And, and, and this controls the flow in and out of the, of the fuel vapors, in and out of the manifold, so they don't get released into the air. And that could fault. That's an electrical component that actually has mechanical hookups to it. So that could be a problem with the system. Or you could have a vent solenoid, or like I said, the gas cap could go bad. A lot of times they leak. It's going to cause a pressure release, and it's going to actually read it. Here's the actual vent solenoid. Now, the vent solenoid is located right here in the whole unit that's located under the car. And when we smoked it, we actually tipped this unit down, and you can see the smoke pouring out from one of the hoses right there. I mean, there's nothing to it. It's going to be easy because Rock Auto provides either the whole thing or the components to fix the car with. Tom, you got something on Rock Auto that'll help anybody with some common failures or pattern failures on these cars. Yeah, if you're looking through rockauto.com, you'll see parts that the, the uh, print is in bold, bold print, or you'll see little heart icons. Those are all signals that custo other customers have bought those parts frequently, and that can be a clue about a, a common failure for that vehicle. My wife has a 93 Ford Tempo. Uh, it was making an awful clattery sound. Uh, I look in the catalog, harmonic balancers in bold print. 
that was a clue. To, I thought to look there, and sure enough, the harmonic balancer is a common, commonly replaced part on that particular engine. Now that's huge for a professional tech, someone like myself, or even a do-it-yourselfer, because if I see that bolt on there, you know, there are pattern fares with the car. This happens to be one of them. So we'll go ahead and we'll replace this. We'll clear that code. We'll take it on a test drive. Project M&M's coming along really, really well. But you know, let's walk over to the computer because I want to check out some of these common failures. I got some other problems that I might need some parts for. Sounds good. Well, we chased down our PO442, that small EVAP leak. I mean, smoke in the system, that was the way to go, man. I mean, we saw the leak back there. You know, we went ahead and replaced the gas cap, and we went right ahead and placed the whole EVAP system. But that brings us to those pattern failures. I mean, these cars have pattern failures, and that's what we call it in industry. I know they're common failures, but, you know, there's so many cars. There's coils on that car. There's EVAP systems. There's mass airflow sensors that really, when they come in, it's a lot of items that we check really, really quick. You can help us there as well. At rockauto.com, we can help you identify those black box sort of parts, what is, even is this part, and then we have a couple ways to see us if it's something that other customers have been replacing frequently. If other people need to replace it on their, their cars, you may need, may need to replace it on yours also. When we pull up our grand marquee, we can look at, uh, yeah, ignition coils. See how yeah. ignition coil is bold compared to ignition up here? Okay. Um, that tells us a lot of customers buy ignition coils for this vehicle. And we did that last week. I mean, you know, that misfire code, it was a random misfire, but then what a customer may do is put a coil on and then another one fails and a coil on. And there's eight of those jokers. So, you know, we replaced them all, but I can see why that someone would go to this. And you also have a lot of choices on the coils. Right. A lot of choices is a clue. If a lot of manufacturers are making replacements, <laughs> then there's a big market for, for replacements. Th these hearts are a clue. These are um, brands of uh, coil that people have bought a lot from us. So bold print means we sell a lot of them and the hearts are, these are the customer's top choices. Now what about the mass airflow sensor? I know there's a lot of problems on that car. Can you dig that up? I bet you there's a heart there. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're totally, especially in Florida, we got love bugs and they're flying in them and you know, there's a heated element and it's causing false readings and all kinds of things. So we're cleaning them continuously and they cause big problems on these cars, especially when it comes to running. So let's just take a look, I'm curious. So mass airflow sensor, sure enough, yes, ah. it's bold print. Bingo. We have lots of manufacturers. We, we have a, a Motorcraft and Cardone are, are hearted. A lot of people are, are buying that particular part number. So yeah, yeah definitely another, uh, another way to get clues about how to di diagnose your vehicle based on what other people are buying for it. Well, Tom, how cool is that? I mean, this is a good way to diagnose your vehicle. I mean, if you have a bunch of problems that are failing and everybody's buying them and your diagnostic leads you in that direction, it's probably what's wrong with your car. But stick around. We got plenty more Tech Garage when we return. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is being brought to you by Custom Auto Sound, the originator of classic car OEM fit radio since 1977. Clamp Tight, the clamp making tool. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Now it's the video question of the week time. Roll it, maestro. I've recently had a battery and an alternator replacement and I left it sitting for a couple of days and it still, as you can see, will not crank. Can you please guys help me out? Two words to add to your vocabulary, Paul, parasitic drain. I think that's probably what you're dealing with. Yeah, exactly right, Paul. Listen, you let it sit for a couple of days, go to the airport, you come in or whatever you're doing, go to crank it up. You just had a battery and charging system, something that is a draw or a drain that's actually taking some electricity when it's not supposed to. That's what a parasitic draw is. You shut the car off, there's gonna be some small ones, computers, radio, things like that, 50 milliamps or less, but you can test this right out in the driveway, Brian. First thing you need to do is shunt your meter. Go get you a DVOM and you shunt your meter. Well, what does that mean? I'm taking the lead and I'm moving it over here. And why am I doing that? because it's fused. I want to run it through a fuse protection part of the meter because we're going to hook the meter up in series so all those little electrons running through your car that's making that drain happen are going to go through here and the meter is going to count them. Now the next part, Brian, you got to hook this joker up. Yep. I'm going to switch it over to amps. Flipping the amps. Okay, and down here it's very simple. 
You just want to intercept the negative battery cable, which we've done. So with the ground cable, I'm hitting the post, reconnecting to that negative battery cable. We're completing the circuit. What that means is we're looking at that entire electron flow through the visualization of the DVOM right here. Exactly, it's current flow, it's electron movement. They have to go home. So if anything's going home to the battery right now, the meter's counting them and you can see nothing's going home. We're talking about 50 milliamps, that would be point 0.05 amps, so anything above that. Now what do we mean? Well, I can give you a demonstration. If I go fire up the water pump there, wow, there that thing's go. drawing yeah. four amps, Almost four and a five. half amps. Now that's gonna kill your car in a couple hours, obviously, <laughs> but there's other drains too that are small. I mean, we can do a couple other ones, but you know, we can turn on the ignition system, fuel pumps running, there's seven amps for a fuel pump system, yep. okay? Well, that's not helping you, Paul. What's gonna help you though, is you're gonna have to find it. And here's how you find it. I wanna show you a cool thing. A lot of people do this all the time, cell phone chargers. Well, you put a cell phone charger in there, you don't think much of it, there's a little light there. Well, this isn't gonna hurt much, but we're tacking them on. We're not even up to either 10 milliamps yet, but if I take my cell phone out, decide to leave that joker in the car overnight, and it's charging, bammo. All night long. 300, 400 milliamps. Now, over time, it's gonna kill the battery, exactly what's gonna happen. Now, how do we find it? That's the key here. That's the key. All right, check this out. I'm gonna come down here to the fuse panel. Find the fuse panel on your car. There may be multiple fuse panels, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna start pulling fuses till it goes away. So I'm watching the draw. If I come over and I pull this fuse, what do we got, Brian? No difference. No difference, so it's not on that circuit of the vehicle. What if I pull this one? No difference. No difference, okay. So then what we do is I come over here and I keep pulling fuses until? Bingo. Bingo. That's it, we're at zero, no drain. No drain. Now, you may be at 50, 40, 60 milliamps. Some other circuits may have radio circuits, computer circuits. Couple keys here, Brian. Make sure you shut the doors, take the key out of the ignition, and make sure the hood's closed. You open up the hood to hook the battery up, what turns on? Yeah, the dome light. Boom, dome yeah. lights, hood lights, doors, keys lights. have bat systems. Sometimes it takes the computers up to 30 minutes to go to sleep for this parasitic draw to go away. So don't jump right on it, let it sit for a while, and obviously, check this out. There Unplug you your cell phone or any accessories in there. There you go. So with your new battery and your charging system restored, you want to protect that investment. This is how you check for a parasitic drain. Hey, keep coming to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. We love hearing from you here in Tech Garage. Yeah, and you know what? Join us next week. We're out of time for this week for the highly technical but always practical Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Production assistance for Tech Garage is provided by Chipola College, located in Mariana, Florida. Founded in 1947, Chipola was recently ranked as one of the top three community colleges in the United States.